said the summer was over. NBA summer never ends. Seku Smith on the Hang Time Podcast here at headquarters in Atlanta. My main man, John Schumann, somewhere with his feet in the sand. Shu, where are you? Somewhere in North Carolina. <laughs> Parts unknown. And Michael Lee of Yahoo Sports joins us from D.C. Mike, what's happening? Hey, you know, just chilling. Hey, man. Yeah, at least you ain't in Vegas. Well, yeah, because I wouldn't be chilling if I was in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be melting. <laughs> exactly. Fellas, the NBA offseason, you know, has finally slowed down enough. So now this is the perfect time, I think, to take a little step back, you know, scan the Eastern Conference and predict how the offseason moves that have gone on are going to affect all 15 teams in the East. So no sense in belaboring the point. Shoe, I know you came out with your mid-offseason rankings for the East on NBA.com. Very interesting list, one that I cannot argue with, basically. Um, I think you nailed it pretty much up and down, but... Let's go through these. A list according to Shoe, starting with Boston, 55 and 27 record last season. You know, one of the top teams, and then went through the playoffs without their two best players by most people's standards, and and still got to the conference finals. Is it a foregone conclusion that the Celtics start at number one on everybody's list in the East? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you're talking about the team that had the number one defense in the league last year, and now they're going to have an offense with Kyrie Irving, Gordon Hayward, Al Horford, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Terry Rozier. A year back better Marcus Morris. So I think, you know, this should, team should be a top five team on both ends of the floor in my mind. You know, obviously there's variables with both Toronto and Philadelphia, but I don't know how you would not put this team at the top of the list. Shoot, they should have been in the finals this year. I mean, if they didn't shoot seven, <laughs> a thousand from three point range in game seven in Boston against Cleveland. So, you know, so we were really talking about a team that should have been in the finals as it was without Irving and Hayward. Mike, is it as simple as healthy stars back and they get right back to where they've been the past? two years. That helps, but I also think that the confidence that Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum were able to develop through the playoffs, able to you know maintain continuity by bringing back Baines and also um, Marcus Smart and having right now the best coach in the conference, Brad Stevens. I mean, they have all the elements that point to them being the dominant team. So the interesting thing is just how Brad Stevens is going to be able to balance all of that talent and making sure that guys are going to be willing to accept the lesser roles once everything starts to come to play. You know, Terry Rozier really played well with Kyrie Irving being down but is he going to be cool playing fewer minutes if Kyrie's out there being healthy? Is Tatum going to take a back seat or is Brown going to take a back seat now that Hayward's there? How are they going to handle all that? That's the only area of concern, but I'd rather have too much talent and not enough. No, that's a great point. I feel like you figure somebody's role has to shift with Hayward and with Kyrie back come postseason time. I'm wondering if that's going to hurt a guy like Rozier, if that's going to diminish what a Tatum or a Jalen Brown can do when you have those other veteran players in the mix. I hope not. I'm just wondering what kind of effect that's going to have on that group as a whole. Yeah, that's the one challenge that our grass team is going to face is trying to help guys understand just what their contributions are going to be. I think last year, if Hayward doesn't get hurt, it's easier to sort of tell guys, tell Jason Tatum, tell Jalen Brown, hey, yeah, you got the weight around. We got an all-star here at this position. But, you know, when Jason Tatum's led them in scoring during the playoffs, how are you going to tell him to take, <laughs> take a, you know, a back seat? And, and Jalen Brown has some great games as well. And I think the guys are going to have to find ways to really earn their keep on the floor. Like Jalen Brown's going to have to be that much more of a lockdown defender, I think, to justify his minutes. And, and Jason Tatum's going to have to be a much even more consistent scorer, even though he did a great job in the postseason to justify his minutes. And, you know, Terry Rozier, I think there'll be opportunities for them to play small and he can play with Kyrie at times. I think he really showed that he can do a lot more than just be a, a spark plug off the bench. He can create he can do other things for his teammates. And I love what they have in Boston, what they've assembled. I like the fact that Danny Ainge has a team of just dogs, like just a bunch <laughs> of guys who are just going to grind it out and just scrap. But they're also skilled. Marcus Morris already told somebody to try him on Twitter this summer because <laughs> you know he's not going to back down from anybody. No. And he's, it's going to be just, what's his role going to be? Because obviously he might be the guy that you expect to take a much smaller role. And I think that's what they anticipated coming into the season anyway. But I just think it's going to be interesting. Like I said, I'd rather have too many players with so many skills than to not. And who knows? They may also be able to keep all those pieces together for whenever they need to make another move to add another big superstar player to just make Boston just unbeatable. No, that's, that's exactly what it looks like. Shoot, you got Toronto as number two. I think a lot of people might have had Philadelphia even in that number two spot. What made you put Toronto ahead of Philly on this list? I think they have fewer questions than Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia, we'll talk about them in a minute, but I just think Toronto, this team won 59 games last year. I mean, this was a really good team. The only team that ranked in the top five 
five on both ends of the floor last year. We know what happened in the playoffs, but I think you still have to take what they did over 82 games into account and how good they were. And I thought that that was more characteristic of the team they were than what we saw in the conference semis against Cleveland. So they're going from DeMar DeRozan to Kawhi Leonard. And we talked about Boston having the number one defense last year. I think Toronto could put together some fantastic defensive lineups when you talk about Leonard and OG Ananobi at the forward spots and a a small ball center and and Ibaka or Siakam and then some combination of Kyle Lowry, DeLon Wright, Danny Green in the backcourt. So that that could be a fantastic defensive team. For me, you know, I think the obvious question is, one, how healthy is Kawhi Leonard? Two, how in Engaged will he be? You know, even if he's healthy, will they be getting the best of Kawhi Leonard, given him not necessarily wanting to be there, or not that that's not the team he wants to be traded to? So we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. But they have a high ceiling. I mean, this team could be really, really good. They were really good in the first place, and then they just added top ten players. So I think the floor for Toronto is higher than that of Philly. Um, Philly has a ton of variables. Obviously, if Simmons and Bead and Fultz all take a step forward. And if Simmons and Fultz can play together, if one of them can shoot and therefore they can actually play together, they didn't play at all together in the playoffs and barely played together in the regular season last year, then obviously their ceiling is high too. But I think there's just a little bit more certainty with Toronto, just given their depth and their, you know, their veteran core. There's a name you missed that you left out of that uh, discussion. That's Danny Green. They got him in the trade too. And I think that he does so much for them in terms of being that two-way guy, being a guy that can stretch the floor and also, you know, give it to you on the defensive end. I think that that's another element to that end of the floor that, that really makes Toronto that much, you know, more dangerous. I just feel like, you know, you add him and Kawhi, two guys who you know are going to compete on that end of the floor. And that's the area where Toronto really faltered in the postseason with on the defensive end. Like you said, the, the ceiling is so much higher now with this group. That's sort of what I like. I like the addition of Danny Green. I think he's, he isn't mentioned enough. In the 2013 NBA Finals, after Game 5, you know, he was looking like he might want to be in the Finals MVP because <laughs> he was hitting all those all those threes and all those shots. I mean, that was a long time ago. I feel like he's a guy who can still give you something. Yeah, he's going to have a green, green light under with Nick Nurse. I think Nick Nurse is going to take sort of the Raptors' evolution, offensive evolution and take it another step forward with shooting threes. And this could be a team that approaches Houston in regard to the number of threes that they take. So they're replacing, when you think about it, they're at the two, they're replacing DeRozan, who didn't shoot a lot of threes, obviously was a terrific offensive player, with Danny Green, who will shoot almost all, you know, that will be basically all he shoots. So I think yeah, he's obviously a big element. They can put a lineup with five shooters on the floor as well, and I think that'll be interesting as well. Of course, the key is always going to be Kawhi. But... No doubt. But am I wrong for – I want Joel Embiid in the finals. I, got... I know it's selfish, <laughs> and I know it's sensational, but he is a great player. And Philly yeah. has the pieces, however young they are. I want Embiid in the finals to see if he can back up all that big talk on the biggest stage. I want Joel Embiid head-to-head against either the Warriors, Rockets, whoever comes out of the West. I want to see him going head-up against whoever comes out of the West because I want to see if Embiid is, you know, every bit the showman that he is, ball player, capable of performing on that level. But I don't know if Phil, I don't know if his supporting cast is ready for that. I'm not sure. Yeah, this offseason was really disappointing. They, they had all the money cap space uh, available to really go after that marquee star. You know, Brett Brown obviously said that they were star hunting. You know, they want to get all the pieces they can to make a trade, make a big trade. Didn't go after aggressively enough after Kawhi Leonard. It's understandable because they kind of have to play two games. One, where you think about the long-term viability of your franchise, but also you don't want to do that just for one short-term hit, especially if Kawhi is not going to be fully committed. But then also they never got a meeting with Paul George. LeBron James sent his agent to meet with them, so you know he wasn't that serious about going there. That was just more out of just respect for their treatment for Ben Simmons and for the San to share the same agent. But I just feel like losing Marco Bellinelli and Ersan Lasova, two guys who were really huge, their second-half turnaround. You know, that 16-game winning streak, especially when they lost MB, was due largely in part to them having guys who could stress the floor and who could knock down shots. And the only thing they did to really address their shooting was to get keep J.J. Reddick, but then add Mike Muscala. And I guess that's a, that's a solid piece, but it doesn't really move the meter. And neither does getting Wilson Chandler, who's a really versatile kind of scoring forward. He's not a star. And I think that at this stage, for them to really be that team that can really compete for championships, 
They need that extra star, and they have the potential. If Markel Fultz can actually play up to the level of being number one pick, but you have to wonder where his head's at, because I think last year it's going to play out. The, the main issue he had wasn't necessarily his shoulder, but more his head, and I think, or what's between his head, and I think if he can get past those mental hurdles that held him back last year, then maybe Philadelphia can make that leap. But I think that what this offseason basically proved is that their ceiling is going to be rooted in their three stars, the three the three guys that they drafted. Right. You saw where Ben and Joel were able to take them. If Markel can raise his game to sort of play at that level that we expected him to play at, then maybe they do make that leap. But that's a lot to ask for a guy who still doesn't have a consistent jump shot. Yeah. Shu, do you think the Colangelo situation and the Sixers having to tend to that and not being able to focus solely on targets and free agency and, and that whole pump and circumstance, do you think that affected their offseason? Or do you think this was something where maybe guys just weren't convinced that Embiid and Simmons are enough to contend at that highest level? I mean, I don't necessarily think so because LeBron, like Mike said, basically had his eyes set on L.A. Paul George didn't even – give anybody a meeting you know he basically recommitted to Oklahoma City yeah. right away and the Kawhi Leonard situation was a trade situation so those are their three targets I think and and missing out on them I don't think is a if you take each case individually I don't think there's a sign that GM situation played a fact mm-hmm. was a factor so I don't think so and I totally agree with my I think you know with Fultz is obviously a huge question but I think both Embiid and Simmons have steps forward to take as well I mean Simmons you know didn't shoot outside of 15 feet last season. Yeah, what do you take? Eight um, threes the whole season? Get better and beat. I'll say, what do you take? Huh? Like 12 threes, eight threes, or whatever the whole season? Most yeah. of them were, yeah. They weren't even like within the flow of an offense. Yeah. Uh, Embiid, I think we saw an, an issue with his conditioning in the mm-hmm. playoff against Boston where fourth quarters, I think fourth quarters were an issue with this team all season long. And part of that may have been a conditioning issue with Embiid. You know, before he gets to the Warriors, he's got to get through Al Horford, who outplayed in the conference semi. So um, well, in Embiid's defense, I will say that I think missing that time with the orbital fracture and coming back, that was tough yeah. to come back just from, you know, being out of the game for two weeks and being thrown right in the playoff intensity and not really having a rhythm. I think a lot of his issues with conditioning were the result of him coming back from an injury and not really playing basketball. If he had been able to play consistently without having that, that break at the end of the season, he may have been, played at a different level. But you're right. Al Horford had some lessons for him throughout that entire <laughs> playoff series. Like, he, he brought out the, the pencil. <laughs> and and, uh, and a little that remember that little Indian chief uh, notebook y'all had? He had that whole thing set out that Joel and B. And he's like, yeah, yeah, take some notes right here, son, because this is how you learn. The process, baby. We talked about it on our blog table a few weeks ago. I don't see why I can't say that Al Horford isn't the best player in the Eastern Conference. If the talent-wise, it's Embiid and Antetokounmpo, Al Horford outplayed both of those guys in the playoffs. You know. And with Boston, we talked about Boston. We didn't mention Al. He's going to be their fifth or sixth leading scorer, but he's going to be their most important player. Their most valuable as far as if they lose him, they're in trouble yeah. because all those other guys are sort of, you can replicate what each of those other guys brings. If you lose one, there's a two or three guys to step into his place. If they lose Horford, then, you know, that guy is the fulcrum of their team, especially defensively, but on offense as well. Yeah. Seku Smith. John Schumann and Michael Lee of Yahoo Sports here on the Hangtime Podcast, breaking down the Eastern Conference. That was Tier and, uh, 1. Yes, that was the upper crust. That was the 1% of uh, <laughs> of Eastern Conference power brokers. I would bet that there are guys in these next two spots, next three really, who are upset already that they were not including them in that in that upper crust. Um, Victor <laughs> Oladipo became an all-star. Nate McMillan gets a contract extension. Indiana all signs are pointing to them moving up, adding Tyreek Evans, adding another shooter and Doug McDermott. Some of the young guys growing, getting another year in the system. T.J. Leaf, I'm sure they're expecting bigger and better things out of him. I understand that Lance Stevenson has gone to L.A., so you don't get a chance to enjoy all that Lance brings to the party in Indianapolis anymore. But are the Pacers a solid number five? And shoot, put them at number four, Mike. Are they a solid four or five in your mind in terms of Eastern Conference pecking order? I would think so, just considering – They'll have continuity of bringing everybody back. You know, last year was the first year that they all were together. Nate McMillan was really able to implement everything that he wanted to do in terms of them, you know, kind of picking up the pace a bit. And Tyreek Evans was just a real solid uh, move in free agency. I think that Miles Turner is a guy we keep waiting on to see, like, how high he can take his game. And I think if he can, you know, continue to make those leaps, then, you know, he raises their ceiling. I think he's just a, a really special talent. 
he's able to do so much, but they have so much talent, man. They have the bonus of a guy that, you know, yeah. that was last, last year the first time he really got to play, you know, major minutes. He proved that he was capable of handling more. So I love what Indiana has, and I, I think the continuity is just something that can't be overlooked. Remember last year, Toronto, when they ran off to that 59 wins, a lot of that's because they had the same team. They played a different style, but they had a lot of the same players, and I think that's a huge benefit, and that's going to help them a lot. And Ola Depot is just a guy whose confidence is past 100 right now. He's just a guy who, who's feeling himself, and he's put in the work. That Team USA, you saw some of the things he was doing, working out with KD and Paul George. You could just see, like, he didn't feel like he was a guy working his way up. He felt like he was on that level. Right. And that's really the big step for any team that's going to make a rise is, what does your star feel about where he stands with the elite? I think Victor feels like he's right there. Shu, do you think that we're underplaying the power of an individual like Giannis? You got him at five on your list, which I think is spot on. But he could very well be the best player in the East this season. It could be a viable MVP candidate. Is he good enough yet to take that Milwaukee team and elevate them to that next level? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't know if their sort of inconsistencies and their failures last season were about him or just about the supporting cast of players around him. I mean, we saw Boston, I was at Game 7 when they lost to Boston, and like he, he didn't play very well, but it was mostly because all the attention was on him. And I think the task for Mike Budenholzer is to be able to complement him you know, or devise an offense where they can take advantage of any extra attention on him or they can free him up, give him the space to operate. And maybe that starts with better defense so that they can get him out in the open floor more often. But I think he still has steps to take. Obviously, his jumper is still not there. I think the evolution of his post game has been interesting to watch. Mm-hmm to see where that can take him. I like that the Bucks brought in Ursan Ilyasova and Brooke Lopez, two bigs that can shoot, so they can put four shooters around him. But I actually mostly curious how they defend. You know, this is a team, when Jason Kidd came, they rose to, you know, I think top five defense, and then they fell off. They sort of fell, and they haven't been very good on that end since then. But they have the tools. They have the length, the size to be an excellent defensive team. And like I said, if they can step forward on that end of the floor, that gets uh, Ansu Kumpo out in the open floor more often. Mike, we talk about the the impact new players can have. Can Budenholzer have the same kind of impact on that Milwaukee team that he had on that Atlanta team when they won 60 games and went to the Eastern Conference Finals? Can he take some of these guys that you don't expect huge things from and make them all-stars in his system? I, I, you would hope so. That's one of the reasons why you would think they, they went after him yeah. because he can maximize the talent on that roster. You know, One of the things about that Bucks team is that they were so frustrating because you looked at them on paper and you're like, why is this team just so average? Why are they so mediocre? They should be so much more better You know, because Eric Bledsoe is a tremendous athlete, the guy, you know, who can get buckets. You know, Chris Middleton clearly is a guy who can do so much on both ends of the floor. He's a truly special talent. And you know who Giannis is. We already know what he is. So they have a lot of talented pieces, a lot of guys who can play. It just felt like they never had a system or a structure that was going to put it all together. And that's what knows his challenges. He's got to really put this all together because I look at their roster and I think that they're one of the more talented teams in the East, but they severely underachieved last year based on what they had. But it's going to have to be a guy that can really just have that kind of structure that they can work in, that they can really be what we expect. Because I, I was really disappointed in how just inconsistent they were last year yeah. because it didn't like they knew what they were doing. And I think that now maybe have a solid scheme, a solid system, one that's had success in the past, we can see them bring out the best in the talents they have because – they got way too much talent just to be a 44 win team. Yeah. I know people talk about the biggest gamble, you know, in the East being Masai trading for Kawhi and whether or not that works out. That's a gamble that's different than what the Wizards are gambling on, which is they're gambling on Dwight Howard somehow being the Dwight Howard of old. The one that we saw in Orlando lead a team to the finals and be the centerpiece of a franchise. Is that bad money at this stage of the game still throwing it down that Dwight Howard will? It's a dangerous game. <laughs> I, I, I think I don't think they're expecting ahead, too much. I mean, it's not like they gave them this huge contract. I don't get the trading Martin Gortat because of chemistry issues and then replacing him with Dwight Howard. Like, I don't get that calculus at all. But, you know, this is a team where if they just brought the gang back together, should feel better about how their season will go as long as they get, you know, more than 41 games out of John Wall and maybe tweak some things so that Otto Porter gets a bigger bite of the offense, make their offense a little bit less predictable. One thing with them is they've had a bad bench the last couple of years and maybe Austin Rivers and Jeff Green help them on that end of the floor. Neither of them is going to be consistent, but yeah. at least there's talent there that can help that bench and it gives them a little bit 
more versatility. You know, you could play some Markeith Morris at center, so you're not dependent on Howard as much. You know, play a, a you know Green at the four, Morris at the five lineup with Rivers or an Oubre in there also. So, you know, they have a little bit more versatility, you know, a little bit better bench, more talented bench at least. We'll see how it plays out. As long as they have more than 41 games from John Wall, they should be better. Even even with putting the Wall thing aside, I mean, this is a team that just lost too many games to bad teams last year. Yeah. And it's, it's about consistency and playing up to their talent level in, in many ways. Yeah, and I, I thought it was a dangerous game, but I wasn't necessarily saying that they were relying on Dwight. It was a dangerous game in that they're not expecting as much out of Dwight. It's just what is Dwight expecting out of Dwight? Exactly. And if he thinks he's going to be that guy, then that's going to be a problem. But if he's willing to accept that John Wall is going to feed him, going to spoon feed him layups and dunks like he's never had before, then I think that aspect will be fine. The one thing that concerns me about the Wizards is this. They put so much on John and Brad, and they really take it all in that they have to do so much to carry the team. But I think the only way this team is really going to become something special is if John and Brad both take a step back, understand that they're both all-star guys, but not be so concerned about their numbers that they take away from their teammates. And I think that's what's going to be the key for them this year is that if they take two or three fewer shots and give those shots to, say, Otto Porter, that's going to open up their offense in ways that it hasn't been before. Because I think one of the problems that they encountered, because you got they, John Wall missed half the season, but their record with him was basically the same as it was without him. So it didn't really have that much of an impact um, whether he played or not. But I think that he, obviously, when he's on the floor, he makes them a better team. But he makes them a better team if everybody's involved and everybody's still engaged. And that's going to be something on Stop Brooks to do to make sure – that everybody feels invested. Everybody feels like they're in on this because the Wizards put so much on their stars. And like I said, those guys, they willingly accept that they want that. They want the pressure. They want that scrutiny on them. But if the team will be better, if they're willing to spread the wealth a little bit and make sure that everybody's getting their shine and not worry about the stats and just kind of focus on wins. And I think that's been one of the main issues that they had last year. And that's why it was such a joyless season because so many guys are just like, man, they just didn't feel like they were a part of it. They didn't feel like they, they played a big enough role. And that doesn't mean they got everybody's got to get 20 shots a game. Right, it right. just means that you're involved and that you feel like your contributions are respected and are important. And I think that's really what's going to be the key for the Wizards this year is that they're two main stars, so they take a step back to help everybody else take a step forward. I think they're the, the wild card team in the East, by the way. I really do. I think if they get off to a hot start, say, and Dwight is feeling good and they stay healthy, they could be the team. There's a void in the East, and we'll get to that in a few minutes when we talk about Cleveland. But having no LeBron means that there's a slot. There's a wide-open slot in the Eastern Conference for somebody to step in and kind of run with it. Now, Shu, you you surprised me and you pleased me with your number seven pick. And that's not (laughs) because I'm a homer and because I love my Pistons or anything like that, but I love that they got Dwayne Casey. Then they went out and got a Michigan man and Glenn Robinson the third, and then they added my all-time favorite head busser Zaza Pachulia to the squad. This I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it means anything, but that combination of elements, along with you know Blake Griffin, Andre Drummond, and healthy Reggie Jackson, maybe Detroit kind of gets back to where we thought they were headed early. Understand Van Gundy under Casey. Um, I saw Case in Vegas, and he was. He was juiced. He was fired up. I was glad to see him that excited about the challenge in Detroit. Do you feel like there's a, a potential for them, Shoe? And they've got young guys, Stanley Johnson, Luke Kennard. they got some young talent that needs developing. Who better than Dwayne Casey to get in there and get his hands on him? But do you feel like they've got the potential to be a team that's on the rise in the East? Blake Griffin is one of the best talents in the Eastern Conference right now, right? There's some solid play. You didn't mention Reggie Bullock. He was one of the best three point right. shooters in the league last year. Right. My question is Griffin and Drummond, can they get the best out of each other, basically, yeah. when they're playing together? How does that how is that gonna work? I mean, Casey has talked about bringing a more modern offense like he had in Toronto last year, but I don't know how that works if Griffin and Drummond are playing the four and the five together. Lob um, City East, know. baby, Lob City. <laughs> mm. Um, you know, how do you play yeah. four out? with Griffin and Drummond. And Griffin has started taking a lot of threes the last couple of seasons. 
Um, but he's still really slow and kind of deliberate with his release. You know, he's not a, hey, catch. He's not an Anthony Tolliver, who's, a, I think, an important piece that they, they lost this summer. You know, their offense was best when Tolliver was playing with one of those two, with Griffin and or Drummond as the second big, and they were separate. So I'm curious to see how it's going to work offensively and defensively a little bit. Can can they defend in space those two guys and, and, and be able to, to switch, to move defensively like you need to do now nowadays? Yeah. Obviously Reggie Jackson's a, a huge question as well, just his health and his ability to get into the paint and create stuff for everybody else. Yeah, that's what I want to jump on with him. Just mm-hmm. like I I have a lot of doubts about the Griffin Drummond pairing, but I think that a healthy Reggie Jackson can open up the floor for them in so many ways. And I think that's going to be the key for the Pistons. Is like, can Reggie Jackson stay on the floor? Can he really give them what they need? Because I think Casey's hands are going to be full trying to figure out a way to make it work with Griffin and, and Drummond on the floor. I just, I'm still trying to scratch my head to figure out what they see because I don't know how that's going to work. Yeah. The eight, nine, and 10 spot shoe on your list, I think, uh, are pretty much right on where they need to be. Miami at eight, Cleveland, Sands, LeBron, you know, with extended Kevin Love and Colin Sexton in as the point guard. And the Hornets, you know, with James Borrego. Interesting, you know, time he's going to have with Tony Parker added to the mix. I just don't know if that A spot is up for grabs as it looks for several teams on paper. Miami should be there, but I don't. Miami didn't do anything. They didn't. It's not like they went out and added some magical piece. Spent all their money last year, so they yeah. couldn't do anything this year, basically. Yeah. Well, they don't, don't forget they'll be getting Deion Wade's healthy this year. My bad. I'm sorry. They're getting one of the five best players in basketball. I mean, according to Dion Waiters, yeah. I love and his I mean, confidence. I like, I like Bam Adebayo. I think he could. He's he has a lot of talent. Like he can do a lot of stuff. And so if he takes a step forward on both ends of the floor, I think he could push them a little bit forward. I'm curious, obviously, to see what happens with Hassan Whiteside. You know, I don't think he on paper he shouldn't be playing really that much. <laughs> um, but I don't know. Paying him too much they, to sit. He, he's untradeable, so they have to. And, and, if, they're, if they just, you know, try to keep him engaged somewhat, I think that's the sort of a question I have with this team. Yeah. Cavaliers, Mike, I mean, we don't have as much reason, obviously, to focus on Cleveland right now, um, unless, <laughs> unless we're just diehard Kevin Love fans and want to watch K-Love get put up Minnesota numbers again. Should we just turn our eyes away from that for a season, let, let them grow a little bit, you know, without LeBron in the mix? No, nah, I think I want to watch Cleveland just to see just who Kevin Love is now. Hmm, yeah. You know, I, I remember when uh, LeBron left to go to Cleveland for Miami last time, that the most intriguing part of that was me wanting to see what Chris Bosh was going to become. Right. You know, uh, he has a chance to be a, a number one option again. Now, if he has helped rob us of what he could potentially be, but those first, that first couple, that first month, Chris was putting up twenty and ten, like he was being back to who he was before he had to become a third wheel. Now let's see what Kevin Love is. Is he that guy that was in Minnesota? I mean, he didn't win in Minnesota, but he put up such ridiculous numbers that you had to pay attention to him, and he's yeah. still making all star teams regardless. So. Even if the Cavaliers don't win games, I'm interested in seeing what these past four years have done for Kevin Love's game, what Toronto Moves going to be able to do to help him, you know, become more of a focal point. I'm just intrigued by that. Not just the extension that he signed, it's going to keep him there for a while. But, you know, is he going to increase his trade value now right. um, by playing at a high level? So, in terms of wins and losses, I, I don't really care about the Cavs, but I do want to see <laughs> what Kevin Love is right now. Because yeah. I think the last three years, he arrived in Cleveland as being kind of overrated. And I think he sort of become underrated, you know, by playing with LeBron because he overshadows everything and everybody around him so much. Yeah, I like Mitch Kupchak, by the way, in in Charlotte. I, I wasn't sure what I thought of that when they brought him in to replace Rich Cho as their GM. But after seeing him in at Summer League and watching him work the room, that might be a good thing. A veteran set of eyeballs on that roster to kind of see what shape and direction they want to take going forward in Charlotte. Does Charlotte have any shot, shoe of kind of getting back to where they were a couple of years ago when they were in the playoff mix? I think they're a better team than their, what their record showed the last couple of years. There was a team that had that's had late game struggles quite a bit. Each of the last two years, they've had a positive point differential and a losing record, which tells you that, you know, the positive point differential. So, like, if you rank these teams according to point differential the last mm-hmm. two years, the Hornets would have made the playoffs. Right. So there's potential there. I'm curious to see, you know, how the wing rotation ends up. You know, they could go back to a lineup 
that they had two years ago, which was terrific, which is Walker, Batum, Kid Gilchrist, Marvin Williams, and Cody Zeller. Right. But I think, you know, just in talking to some Charlotte people at Summer League, I think the sort of second wing spot with Batum will be up for grabs with Jeremy Lamb and Malik Monk off in the mix. They need a, a bounce back year from Batum, actually. Big time. You know, he's, he's a guy at a rough season last year. I think he's sort of a variable for them, even though he's a veteran. And then as far as Kupchak, you know, it, he's, it's tough to work with the salaries he's got and right. the, and the long-term commitment that this team has. You know, he's not really going to get much of a chance to, I think, put an, a huge imprint on this team until next year, Kemba Walker becomes a free agent, but everybody else is basically under contract for another year after that. So right. and Kaminsky, is, I guess, is another guy that has a potential to be better than what he's been. But like I said, they, you know, former lottery pick, but, you know, we know who they are, basically. Um, be curious to see how James Brago switches things up and I'll be curious to see like I said if any of the other the wings sort of step up and and we see some different some changes there got you Mike we're getting ready to go lottery lightning round on these last (laughs) lottery bound teams I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings but Brooklyn Nets at 11 Chicago at 12 New York at 13 Orlando at 14 and Atlanta at 15 tell me which of those teams bear the most critical eye this this season which of those lottery bound outfits should be a either the most entertaining or the most intriguing for us to keep our eyes on the most entertaining and the most intriguing are the same that's the Chicago Bulls <laughs> right I, I want to see how this all plays out because right now on paper it looks like it's going to be a disaster <laughs> but I, I, I honestly feel like they looked promising last year with um, Laurie Markin in. I love what I saw out of him as a rookie I'm really excited about Wendell Carter and getting him and yes. as a defensive, you know, big. I'm excited about him, but I'm worried about Zach Levine and Jabari Parker together. And one of them is fine, but both of them, they're going to overlap each other, and they may wind up stunting Laurie's developing in a lot of ways because they're going to be looking to score. You know, yeah. Jabari's already said he, he, he doesn't worry about defense. <laughs> they don't play on the play defense. So we already know what to expect from him. But he's also going to be looking to try to play for his next deal, you know, right. um, if right. things don't work out. And I think for, you know, Zach Levine, he just signed a big contract, so he's going to have to feel like he's got to play up to that standard. Yeah. So it's going to be an interesting mix. They have a lot of intriguing pieces. They have a lot of talent. I'm just interested to see who's going to emerge as the alpha on that squad, but also who's going to be the guy that's going to be willing to take a step back to allow it to work out. So the Bulls, to me, are the most intriguing team, even among lottery and, to some extent, even the teams that are expected to be in the playoffs. Gotcha. So they have such an unusual mix of talent, and uh, I'm not sure how it's all going to come together. Shu, which, what team are you picking out of that bunch that would be the most intriguing, the one that you got to see what they do? I guess Chicago is a group, but in that same bunch, though, I think there's some intriguing individuals. One, D'Angelo Russell in Brooklyn. I mean, mm-hmm. this guy entering his fourth year on his, or his last year in his rookie deal really needs to take a step forward to sh- prove that this is a guy that the Nets can sort of build around. I don't think he is right now or from mm-hmm. what I've seen. You know, what I saw last year, I don't think he is, the kind, one, the kind of player that they like, and two, consistent enough for them to really think that they can depend on him. You know, he might not be the best point guard on the team with Spencer Dinwiddie there. Yeah. And then Atlanta, I mean, I'm going to be watching Trey Young and Luka Doncic, <laughs> you know, closely from from now uh, and for the next 10 years. I mean, how can you not want to compare those two guys? Oh, I know a lot of forward. people in this town are going to be comparing every night. <laughs> I, think, I actually think Orlando could be fun to watch just with all the athletes that they have when you talk about the you know the front line of Mo Bamba, Aaron Gordon, Jonathan Isaac, Isaac but also yeah. like, yeah, Terrence Ross and, and Jonathan Simmons on the wings. I mean, there's a lot of speed, athleticism. Steve Clifford can get them improved defensively. They could be a lot of fun to watch just getting out on the open floor. Isaac looked good, by the way, in summer league. I, I noticed really good. how much different his body looked and how measured and confident he was, Mike. And I think the Knicks, out of all those teams, I know we these other teams are further along, but depending on what happens with Chris Stapps, Porzingis, you know, the, the evolution of Kevin Knox, I think the Knicks are going to be really interesting. What can Frank Gillikina do, you know, now that he's got a year under his belt in the league? I think they're a player next summer, potentially, for a big-time star who wants to go in there and pair up with Porzingis and maybe put the Knicks back on the map. So I kind of look at the Knicks as a team that I'm just going to wait until Porzingis comes back. Mm-hmm. Then I can start paying attention because that'll be <laughs> probably close to the all-star break. Right. And then I'll be close to free agency. And that's when they'll really get interested. But like the first like five months of the season. Straight blindfold. I probably won't, huh? Just straight blindfold for the first five months of the season. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's going to be a lot of a lot of blindfolds for these teams that are in the lottery because it's going to be choppy waters, you know, for them starting out the season. But I'm telling you, the East, I know everybody is blowing taps on the East already. I think it's going to be a much more interesting race without LeBron now. Without LeBron there, kind of us knowing that at the end of the day, his team, whatever, whichever team he's on, for basically the last decade almost, has been the team to beat in the East. Now we don't know. Those top three teams can be really, really good. Yes. And they could conceivably be teams two, three, and four in the, you know, in the NBA. In the league, overall. yeah. Definitely. Exactly, yeah. That's the one thing. I think it's the first time in a while that you can look at the top teams in the East and really say that they're on par. Everybody's below Golden State. Yes. But I think once you get past that, you just start throwing teams in the mix. And there are Eastern teams that are in that discussion as second, third, fourth best team right now. So, yeah, I think that's the first time you can say that in a while. No question. Well, listen, we appreciate everybody joining us this week. John Schumann, get back to vacation. I appreciate you diving in when you're wearing flip-flops every day. Um, Mike, I know you're busy as I don't know what. We rode around in strange cars in Vegas last week, man. That was entertaining. Some of the best fun I have every summer. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I got to get Lyft. I'm just an Uber guy. I got to get Lyft now. Lyft, is, the Lyft drivers are so much more fun. Man, Lyft drivers, eh? It's an experience. It's an experience. And in Vegas, it's a sensory, full sensory experience. I had a couple drivers who are clearly taking advantage of the laws, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but uh, fellas, I, I, I go ahead and help help the people understand. <laughs> there, there were some odors in the vehicle. Yes, that gave us a hint of uh, what they do for extracurricular activities. Yes, there was a little Snoop Dogg in the air. Um, <laughs> In, in, in the cars in Vegas. Next week, we'll uh, we'll dive in, shoot on the Western Conference this time of year and see where everybody fits in the pecking order in the West. Mike Lee from Yahoo Sports joining us here on the Hangtime Podcast. We appreciate you, John Schumann. Seku Smith here. We will see you right here next week on the Hangtime Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Hangtime Podcast, and be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts for a new episode every Thursday this season. And as always... Say Kuna Matata.